There's many ways to preserve food at home, even though most of us tend to think of canning. You say home food preservation, and what comes to mind immediately is canning. However, there are many, many different ways to safely preserve food at home, and a lot of them don't require a lot of equipment. And it's really good that you have multiple ways to preserve food at home in case you can't get certain supplies Canning lids were an issue for many people the past few years, but also not every form of food preservation is safe for every type of food. So having an array of methods that you know how to use to preserve food at home means that you will have a much greater variety of food stacked up in your pantry. So let's start with the most obvious and one that people are most familiar with, and that is going to be canning. So you are going to need to have a water bath canner and or steam canner. So this is my steam canner right here. And this can safely be used for any type of acidic food. So pickles, fruits, jams, jellies, pie filling, all of those fun things can safely be canned in a steam canner or a water bath canner. So even you can do your salsas in there. I've got tomato sauce. Um, this is bruschetta in a jar tomato recipe. And then this is my fruit pie filling. This is blackberry. All of those can be done because they are acidic in a steam canner or a water bath canner. And the great thing is a water bath canner, you don't actually have to buy a canner. You can just use a large enough pot and then take some of your extra bands or twist up a towel to create a homemade rack as long as the depth of that pot, once the filled jar of food is in there, the water level has to be one to two inches above the level of the jar. So it just needs to be a deep enough pot for the size of jars. And you can use any large pot in order to safely water bath can acidic foods. Now, when it comes to your vegetables, meats, broths, non-acidic foods, and the reason for that is because botulism cannot grow in an acidic environment that is 4.6 on the pH scale or lower. The lower the number, the more acidic. So for our non-acidic foods like green beans, vegetable soups, or even things like smoked salmon, we have to use a pressure canner in order to reach high enough temperatures to kill botulism spores because they are not killed in boiling water. And for the love, it does not matter if you boil it for five hours Boiling water never gets above 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Doesn't matter if it's for two hours, five hours, 10 hours, 212 degrees. So you need to use a pressure canner, which I store mine right here when it's not in use. You need to use a pressure canner for non-acidic foods because it is going to allow you to reach an internal temperature when it's at 10 pounds of pressure, 248 degrees Fahrenheit, which you cannot reach in a boiling water bath and no, an oven, even at 248 degrees Fahrenheit, because it's dry heat, it's not a wet heat, is not going to provide you with the same temperatures for the jars and is not safe. So moral of that story is needs to be pressure canned. And you do need to have a pressure canner. There's different models. This is the All American. I can double stack and do 19 pints in here, but there are different models. There's Presto. Some of it depends on your stove type. And I will link to a blog post that will walk you through the best pressure canner model to get for you based upon your stove type and your budget. But of course, canning is an excellent way to create shelf stable food that all you have to do is pop open the jar, heat it if wanted. I do prefer my soups to be heated. Um, or if it's things like pickles or fruits, you just are gonna eat them at room temperature. Now, besides having a canner or making one, as I said, you obviously need to have canning jars and you have to have lids. It is not recommended to reuse these metal lids. There are actually reusable canning lids. I don't have any out right now on these jars, but there are options for your canning lids. So there are of course ball and curve, which is many of you are probably very familiar with these little boxes of canning lids right here, which I do have a back stock of, but there's lots of options for metal canning lids. Um, I have got them, this is a pack of sleeves in bulk. So this is a bulk pack of canning lids that I get from Lehman's. This is 345 regular mouth lids. I actually bought this a couple of years ago, right when the pandemic started, because I had a feeling 
that supplies, especially canning supplies, <laughs> would be in short amount. And so I ordered up that. But there are also now on the market other options for canning lids that you can get in larger amounts or still bulk. So Four Jars has a box of 100 wide mouth lids, as you can see here. And then they also have a box of 100 of the regular mouths. So definitely these are larger than just the 12 count that you usually find at the grocery store from Ball. Um, but not quite as big as the large bulk ones. I'm not even sure if Lehman's has that size bulk anymore. I think they've kind of went down to, you can still buy them in bulk, but I'm not sure you can get those 345 sleeves. Um, but four jars I got to meet, and this video is partially sponsored by them. They sent me these lids to try um, at a couple different homesteading events, which was really fun. So this is definitely an option, and I will have links for this, um, all the different canning lids in the video description, so you can check them out. And it's always good to have multiple options. So I also have another canning company called Denali, who also sent me lids. So this is a multi-sponsored post, but I think it's important that we have lots of different sources and options for things that you're never relying on just one source, just in case. So these are the Denali canning lids. Um, I've actually used these, had great seal success, no issues, was very, very happy with them. And we'll have links below as well. So basically, <laughs> I've got lots and lots of sources, four different sources for you for your canning lids so you can make sure that you've always got these on hand from at least one source and they've all worked very well. Now, aside from canning, there's actually lots of different ways to do our home food preservation. And you'll notice in our home canned goods, one of the things that you cannot can is a lot of your brassicas or at least not like a jar of broccoli. You can do cauliflower if it's pickled in a multi-vegetable pickled recipe. Cabbage, you can can in sauerkraut, but I don't ever can my sauerkraut or any other cabbage things. You can't can cabbage soup because it's m better if you just ferment it. And if you can the ferments like you do with sauerkraut, unfortunately you destroy all of those good healthy benefits. So fermenting is extremely easy. It is a great, great, great way to preserve your food and you only need a few supplies. So you are going to need a, either a glass jar. I like to use the wide mouth when I'm doing ferments because it's much, much easier to pack things in, um, especially if you're doing, this is not actually a wide mouth, I grabbed the wrong jar. You can see the difference, wide mouth versus regular. If I'm trying to pack like whole pickles or even like really get the cabbage in here that's been shredded and pushed down on it, I can get my hand in the wide mouth fairly easily, but there's no way I can pack things tight on the regular mouth. So I only use my wide mouth jars for fermenting. So mason jars, a glass container works great. You also can get fermenting crocs. I love antique crocs. However, the older crocs can have lead in them. So if you're not sure of the age of the croc and you think it might be something that's really old, definitely get a kit that'll allow you to test for lead before using those for fermenting. And then the next thing, you don't have to have these. Technically, in order to ferment, you can make a weight that just uses like an old baby glass jar. You can use like a cabbage leaf or something like that. But when you are fermenting, you need to keep the contents beneath the brine or the liquid level so it doesn't mold when it's fermenting. And easy, I love, I've got several different brands of these. Um, they're glass fermentation weight, weights. Um, I've got this set from Year of Plenty, uh, this one from Kinwell, and I also have um, some other ones. They're all pretty much the same design and they fit into the wide mouth and they've got that little grippy there so that when you have them in here, you can easily just go like that and pull them up. But you can see that they'll fit right in there. So these work great. I just keep these always on hand and reuse them over and over and over again. So when you're fermenting, Imagine this is filled and we've got our weight in there. You can just use a metal lid and this is where you could safely use a used metal lid when it comes to fermenting. But you're just gonna put that on, you're gonna put your band down and then you're gonna put it to just to where you feel resistance when you're fermenting, this is not for canning. And then pull it back about a half a turn. When it ferments, you will get a buildup of gases and so you need to remember to burp your jar. And that simply is loosening this enough and then you'll hear it go psh, and the gases will come out and then you just tighten this back to that spot. But you wanna remember to do that once a day or you can get a large buildup of gases and you can actually have these glass jars explode if you don't burp it. This is a totally an option. I, however, have found 
the different styles of the airlock systems. I've got several different styles. These go right on. They allow the gases to escape um, and they keep from getting the extra air in so you don't have as much mold contamination issues with your ferments. So there's this type of an option. There is this type, still very similar. And these just go right on the, the mason jar while it's fermenting. Or these are another great option. These are the silicone um, little nipple ones. They go like that. And then you just take your regular band and you tighten it down. So these are all great fermentation tops. They all work equally well for me. But I do recommend if you're doing a lot of fermenting, I really like to use these because they have drastically cut down on any type of mold issues when I'm doing my ferment. So I always use these and just have been reusing them for years and years and years. The only caveat with your fermented foods is after they ferment at room temperature, they do need to be moved into cold storage for long term storage. So either a refrigerator or a cold room or area, ideally that's at least 50 degrees Fahrenheit or cooler, but not freezing. So after our fermentation, as I said, oh, and you need to have salt when you're fermenting. I use Redmond's Real Salt. This is both my canning salt as well as my fermenting salt and our table salt. So this is great because it doesn't have added um, anti-caking agents or iodine, which you actually don't want when it comes to fermenting. Um, and it works really good for canning. It's my all around salt. And I actually do have a coupon code. We'll have that down in the video description for you. Um, if you wanna grab, I just buy it in the 10 pound buckets, as you can see, cause we use it for absolutely everything and it stores forever. So you can take advantage of that. And I've got a coupon code for those as well. Then we have got our dehydrated foods. So this is just a regular dehydrator. I've got my stackable trays here. I can put extra ones in or remove them with this model. Just runs on electricity and it allows you to dehydrate multiple forms of food. Here I've got some, the very last of my dehydrated cherries from last year. But that, this is great because it creates a shelf stable food once it's dehydrated. Of course, fruit, usually you're just gonna eat in its dehydrated form but things like vegetables you'll then want to rehydrate with water i tend to use my dehydrating mainly if i'm going to be making some type of a powder like an herbed powder or a green powder um, or for fruit but i usually don't dehydrate my vegetables a lot i've just found i don't feel like they ever fully rehydrate back to the ideal texture that i'm after so instead for vegetables i prefer my freeze dryer now, yes, a freeze dryer is an expensive piece of home food preservation equipment, especially if you compare it to the cost of a dehydrator, which you can get for under $100, or even a, a pressure canner, the steam canner, you know, from it, fermentation tools. This is definitely the most expensive piece of home food preservation equipment, but it is a worthy investment. Now, full disclosure, Harvest Rate sent me mine for free. I honestly wasn't sure how much I would use it. I've had it for almost two years now and it's going right now. So you can hear the level of the noise that it produces. Um, I'm actually freeze drying our raw milk. We got a milk cow. I've got excess milk right now. So I am freeze drying my raw milk so that we've got milk when she's dried up, when she's ready to calve again um, and it will be shelf stable. So a lot of my freeze dried food I have up here, like this is freeze dried yogurt. I do have freeze dried fruit because it is so crispy and airy. The only freeze dried fruit that I actually, I should say the only fruit that I prefer dehydrated still is cherries. And so I don't freeze dry my cherries. I dehydrate those. And this is, we've got freeze dried blackberries, strawberries. What I like about the freeze dryer is it allows me to preserve a lot of food that I don't have another viable option or way to freeze dry. Um, so this is freeze dried. I made homemade instant mashed potatoes. So I've got jars of these and you can see like it powders up. It's very small. So this is allows me to condense and store a lot more food when it's in this powdered form and freeze dried than it would be otherwise. Um, this is a hot cocoa mix from our raw cow's milk um, that I made up homemade, organic, lovely raw milk hot chocolate that I have also freeze dried for the kids. Um, and so I really like that because, and then like I said, these are freeze dried yogurt bites. It allows me to freeze dry items that I really wouldn't have another avenue of doing via canning or regular dehydrating. Um, I've got raw 
eggs. So I have a video showing how to do this. This is freeze dried raw eggs. You can dehydrate cooked eggs. It is not recommended to dehydrate raw eggs. So the freeze dryer allows me to do things raw that I can't do with any other form. Now, you're probably going to laugh at this because this one seems so obvious, but your freezer, your freezer, my friends. This is one of our upright freezers. We have many, but this allows me to preserve a lot of food that I wouldn't be able to do in other manners or I don't prefer it in other manners. So this is crab that we uh, catch ourselves in our little old 20 something year old ski boat and put up. This was from last July. You can, we see we've got that dated there. And you can safely pressure can crab actually, um, but we like to just freeze it in these logs. And so I keep that in here, but I really use my freezer the most um, as you can see for meat. And yes, there's some store-bought burritos and Hot Pockets or whatnot for the kids in there. So just showing you my actual freezer. Um, but I, and you can can whole chicken. So this is our whole birds that we raise, butcher process ourselves here. But I like to roast a whole chicken and then use the carcass to make my bone broth, which I do can. Um, I don't think, do I have any, I don't think I have any steaks in here right now, but you can can a lot of meat, but there's certain cuts that I prefer to not, like a whole chicken. And I don't wanna can my ribeye steak. I wanna grill my ribeye steak. So I like to use the freezer for those types of items. But when you are raising and butchering all of your own meat, or you're doing a whole cow or a quarter cow, a whole pig, etc., you're going to need to have freezer space. So I use the freezer for a lot of the things that, as I said, using all these other methods of food preservation um, aren't safe to do that way, or we don't, it's not actually what we want, how we want the end product to be, like the way we prefer to eat it. But using your freezer can be a very smart way. And actually, you'll see I have in here these are frozen blueberries from last year. I just haven't got around to making those into jam yet, but we're about a month away from our blueberry harvest here, which means I'm gonna have to take those bad boys out and get them processed in a way that is shelf stable uh, to make room for the next harvest. So I will use it that way too, to like store things I haven't had time to put into other forms of preservation. So um, I really like a chest freezer, or an upright dedicated freezer. One, you can put a lot more in them, but two, they actually maintain a colder temperature because you're not opening them as much unless you're doing a video like I am now and actually having the door open like you would a freezer unit that's part of your refrigerator. A deep freezer gets and maintains colder temperatures, which is better for long-term long -term food storage. There's a couple more options. One is actually using alcohol. So this is vanilla, homemade vanilla extract. Um, you can see I've got some of the vanilla beans in there. I don't have much left. I need to get busy making some more of this. But you can use alcohol and vinegar to do different types of infusions that will actually create shelf-stable food products. So you can do fruit infused in alcohol, of course, doing extracts uh, like lemon extract. This is vanilla extract, um, different medicinal tinctures, that type of a thing. I've got a video on making an echinacea tincture um, that we'll link to, and you can check that out. So that's one option, but probably my favorite that takes the least amount of equipment is root cellar techniques. So as you can see, I'm not in a root cellar right now. This is not a basement or a garage, but this is garlic that we raised ourselves and I've got videos on showing how to braid it, all of this. This is from 11 months ago. And this has just been hanging in our pantry once it got cured, dried and braided. And you can see these are great. They're not sprouting. They're nice, firm, they haven't went soft. So I love to do this for garlic. You can do it for onions and you can also do it for a lot of your winter squash. So this is delicata and this is a Long Island, I believe this is a Long Island cheese. I'm trying to remember now all the different varieties that I had, but a pumpkin. This is from last year. The time of this filming, we're almost to July and these were harvested last fall, cured. I have articles on how to do that. And they've just been sitting in the pantry until we need to use them. And as you can tell, there's, there's no rot. They're nice and firm, so they're not going bad inside. And this is just in our home on open shelves, nothing special. So this is one of my favorite ways to preserve food is by doing root cellar methods. And it works really well, as I said, winter squash, onions and garlic, it works the best. You can do it with some other crops, but then you have to have a little bit more control on temperature and humidity for it to work long-term. Now, these are some of my 
overview of easy ways to do home food preservation, lots of different methods, and many of them don't take a ton of equipment in order to do them. Some more than others, obviously a pressure canner or if you're going to be doing a freeze dryer. And if you are curious or want a book that says how to do all the different forms of home food preservation with step-by-step -step tutorials, safety info, recipes, then my new book, Everything Worth Preserving, will be coming out this fall, but you'll be able to pre-order it and get access to the digital version before the hard copies begin shipping. And I'm so excited because it goes through and it takes in alphabetical order, fruit, vegetables, and meat, and you'll simply turn to the page for green beans, and it will list on a chart of all the nine methods, ways to preserve food at home, which ways are safe for you to, to do that, and then my favorite recipes in the exact step-by-step -step tutorial. So no matter what you have coming in from the garden or you're buying at the farmer's market or even at the grocery store and you're like, oh my gosh, I've got 20 pounds of tomatoes or maybe it's just a small basket of tomatoes. How are the ways that I can preserve this safely with the ingredients and the tools that I have on hand? You'll just flip open to that page in the book and it has it all listed for you right there in one spot. So. I actually created the book for myself because that's what I wanted. And many of you, when you heard about it, you're like, oh my gosh, you have to put this in book format so that I want this exact same resource. So we'll have a link where you can go and check that out and get that on pre-order so that you can have that and preserve a wonderful larder and house full of safely, safely preserved food at home.